Welcome to another four hours of Night Talk. I'm Jack McKinney, and uh, our topic tonight I'm sure you're familiar with by now through our previous promotions, a book by Pulitzer Prize winner Sylvan Fox titled The Unanswered Questions about President Kennedy, and I guess the, the title is indicative of the content, and uh, we have Mr. Fox with us. The book is uh, a... Um, an award books publication, and uh, it uh, is initially released in uh, pocketbook form, which uh, surprises me a little bit, uh, con uh, considering the subject matter. And uh, I would have to say that it's Mr. Sylvan Fox's uh, point of view that the Warren Commission report was anything but definitive and complete, and uh, here to oppose Mr. Fox and his view is Charles Kramer, noted trial lawyer and a member of the International Academy of Tri Trial Lawyers, and uh, Curtis Crawford, an instructor in philosophy at New York University and the New School, also author of a work titled 20 Questions for the Warren Report. I, as a layman, have to uh, confess that uh, the Warren Report is such a formidable challenge. I don't think the average re reader can get past it. Uh, I'll have to ask you about that, Charles because uh, you do take a position uh, defending the Warren Report. Well, uh, for one thing, uh, the makeup of the uh, Warren Commission consisted of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States and uh, six other men. In my opinion, the six uh, uh, leaders, distinguished men of this country, for example, there was Senator Russell of Georgia, Senator Cooper of Kentucky on it, Congressman Boggs of Louisiana, Congressman Ford of Michigan, Alan Dulles, the former head of the Central Intelligence Agency, and finally, Mr. John McCloy, a banker who had served under uh, President Kennedy. Now, these, uh, d these seven men uh, had the assignment from President Johnson to investigate all the facts surrounding uh, both the slaying of the late President Kennedy as well as the uh, death of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. There were no restrictions placed upon them. They could go just about anywhere they wanted. They may had available to them all the investigative agencies of the federal government, plus an opportunity to conduct any independent investigation such as occurred to them. Now, these men, uh, this commission, uh, spent many months interrogating in the actual hearing, both by way of actual witnesses and by way of deposition. Over 500 witnesses testified, actually some 552. And the report itself consists of some 17,000 pages of testimony, which is indicative of uh, how extensive their inquiry went, along with about 11 volumes of exhibits. So it's my feeling that uh, the commission uh, made a very thorough, exhaustive study of the situation and came up uh, with uh, what I think uh, uh, most of the important answers, namely uh, who killed President Kennedy, and uh, as well as whether or not there was any conspiracy or not. All right. Uh, I see that uh, Sylvan has something to say. Well, I think uh, he's going yeah. to refer to his own statement on page 19. No, that's not what I wanted to make one small point that uh, it's important, I think, for the sake of avoiding confusion, to distinguish clearly between the report and the testimony. Uh, Charlie said the report consists of this 17,000 words, uh, 17,000 examples of testimony. It's the testimony is separate. The report is a single volume which was handed to the American people, and the American people were told, here it is. No one said read the testimony. They said read the report. Here are the answers. And this is basically the pitch in the book. But the report, aside from any failings in the testimony, the report itself is inadequate and doesn't give the answers. But, Sylvan, uh, as I started to say in the... Uh in your book, you uh, are critical of the composition of the commission itself. If I can quote you literally, you say, many felt it was too heavily weighted with right-wing and southern sentiment. Its completely political nature was highly criticized. Why, some observers asked, were all the members of the commission drawn from the ranks of those intimately involved in the affairs of the United States government? 
Why were there no disinterested members, a distinguished lawyer, for example, or one of the nation's leading historians, or a prominent psychiatrist? Yes, that, that's a, uh, certainly a statement that I stand on. Uh, I think this was a great failing of the, of the commission of itself and also of the way it was established. Uh, I think we, uh, we would have been better off, we would have had a more comprehensive report if any or all of these additional members had been present in the investigation, in the inquiry. Uh, the, the, the interpretation of many of the aspects of the assassination hang crucially on psychological, uh, a, a kind of psychological picture that's painted by the Warren Commission. But the Warren Commission is not qualified to paint such a picture. It's not made up of psychologists or psychiatrists. Yet, the commission states psychological interpretations of the case. Uh, this is an argument that would not have been raised if the commission had availed itself of competent professional assistance. Similarly, the question of allowing a commission made up of elected officials, appointed officials, and, and uh, a chief justice, who was, I suppose, appointed also, uh, to investigate this case, which so intimately involved the, the, the balance of the United States government. There should have been a historian. There should have been a psychiatrist or a psychologist. There should have been a number of people with less involved interest in the affairs of the government than these people had. All right, Curtis. Uh, I should like to, to comment on the composition committee. I'd, I'd like in a moment to ask uh, Mr. Fox to be as explicit as possible about the, the basis for the, the rather serious charges he makes about the adequacy of the report. But if I may just comment on the commission, I think it's easy to, to make the mistake of assuming if one is unacquainted with the documents and the reports, or the hearings and the documents, it's easy to make the mistake of assuming that those seven men did uh, much of the guiding work. As a matter of fact, those seven men, although they did lend their names and authority to the decision made, did not actually do most of the investigation and did not have in their minds the guiding threads of the investigation. The people who did the investigation were, were staff counsel, and it's interesting that although the criticism can be made that there is a fairly conservative element well represented in the seven men, the staff counsel is a strikingly liberal and highly qualified and intelligent appearing group of people. Uh, I could refer people who uh, who'd want to look them up to uh, pages 476 and following in the Warren Report. I can't read off the biographies at this time, but they are young and very bright people. Yeah, and there are two Philadelphia attorneys who were involved. Oh, one of them is now the uh, district attorney. And I should emphasize here yeah, that... The district attorney-elect, I don't think he's been for right. about a couple months here. I should emphasize here that, that, as a matter of fact, one could say that the president and uh, those others who made these arrangements may have pulled something politically very astute, because uh, by appointing some very conservative men on the top panel, they assured the acceptance of the report by uh, conservative elements in the country, by appo appointing young and highly liberal men in many of those places in the staff council, they tended to assure the acceptance of, of the report on the part of liberal elements in the country. So that, in that sense, both are represented. But now I'd like to put my question. Uh, we're really skirting the issue so far, and I'd, I'd like, if we could, very early in the broadcast, to get Mr. Fox to be specific as to some of the major reasons which have led him to question the adequacy of the report. Back to Night Talk here on WCAU and repeating once again we're discussing the new book by Sylvan Fox titled The Unanswered Questions about President Kennedy's assassination. It's available on bookstands now, an award books publication. It's a pocketbook and uh, it uh, has a very distinguished or uh, a distinguishable cover uh, we might question the taste of the cover a little bit later on, but uh, nevertheless, the important thing about any book is what's between the two covers, and, and one of our guests, Curtis Crawford, has just raised the question, uh, what is the basis for uh, Sylvan Fox's attitude, negative attitude toward the Warren Report? I want to inc incidentally mention that in addition to Sylvan Fox, we have 
and Curtis Crawford, an instructor in philosophy at New York University and the New School, and also the author of a work titled 20 Questions for the Warren Report, and Charles Kramer, noted trial attorney and a member of the International Academy of Trial Lawyers. Now, if we can pick it up at that point, uh, possibly if I just uh, stall for another four seconds, I'll be able to say now this is 121 on your AM dial, WCAU, and WCAU-FM in Philadelphia, and Sylvan, from there you take it. Okay. Uh, I think this is the right question, and uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the two things that bother me about the, the report. There are two large areas that disturb me in, in working on the book. One is the fact that there are many small details that are not answered adequately. The other is the fact that there are large issues that are not answered adequately. Now, I'd like to specify a couple of these. The large issues, I think, are, are these. First of all, there is no explanation of the motive on the part of Oswald. Now, this is a, a, a significant omission from the report, which the report itself admits. Uh, what it means is that the commission, after this enormous investigation, mm -hmm. after a tremendous job of, of questioning witnesses, of examining exhibits, of studying the evidence, could not explain in any degree why Oswald killed Kennedy. The second is, was there a conspiracy? Now, the commission attempts in, in the section of the report on this question to uh, create an impression that it has resolved this problem. However, when you look at that report carefully, you discover that, that indeed it has not adequately explained this thing, that there are any number of smaller matters that come up that, that are left hanging and that have not been uh, resolved to the extent that you can draw the final conclusion that there was no conspiracy. As a matter of fact, it was just called to my attention the other day that Theodore Sorensen, in his new book on Kennedy, says himself, again, one of many, that we will never know whether, there was, whether anyone coached, coerced, or helped Oswald commit the murder. And I agree with him. I think as a result of this report, we will never know. Um, we cannot know from this report. Uh, the other question uh, is, why did uh, Ruby kill Oswald? This question, again, is not answered by the commission adequately. The commission accepts basically Ruby's explanation, which can be seen either as an irrational raving or as a cover-up or as the truth. But there is really no way of telling in that uh, report. The explanation that Ruby gave is that he wanted to spare Mrs. Kennedy the anguish of appearing in a Dallas courtroom for the trial of Lee Harvey Oswald. Now, these are a few of them. There are others. The, the uh, number of shots that, was, that were fired uh, is another element of uncertainty. Uh, the uh, presence of a police car outside of Oswald's house in the three-minute period when he was there between the time he committed the assassination and the time he killed Tippett. Mr. Fox, just a question. Uh, you were divided between big issues and well, uh, smaller issues. Are you now coming to some of the smaller issues? I'm now coming to some of the smaller issues. All right. Uh, the uh, arrival of Jack Ruby in that police station on that Sunday morning at precisely the right moment, not 10 or 15 minutes too soon, not five or ten minutes too late, but at precisely the right moment. The commission says this is, is coincidence. Um, you can accept this as coincidence if you choose, or you can be somewhat skeptical and wonder about the context of the whole episode and, and begin to be concerned about whether the explanation is adequate. My, my desire in this thing, to begin with, I should say, is that was to find an adequate report. I hoped, when I began, that there would not be unanswered questions. I approached this thing as a newspaper man, and I hoped that there would not be unanswered questions. Charles Kramer. So then, uh, in your book on the subject of conspiracy, 
You say that the commission turns its back on a wealth of evidence suggesting that a plot or even two separate plots may have been operative. Now, could you spell out, do you mean by a wealth of evidence the things that you just uh, itemized for us? Is that what you allude to? Well, I, that, that's some of the things. I think you have to read the whole chapter in order to uh, have every detail spelled out. I think I've spelled out some of the things that, uh, that I include. I also uh, could include the, the absence of, uh, of uh, the acceptance on the part of the commission of the absence of any record of the interrogation of Oswald by the police in Dallas, the kind of strange and mealy-mouthed way in which the report covers up, and I mean covers up, this is a, a serious one as far as I'm concerned, the, the, the destruction of those interrogation notes that, that Captain Fritz had. The report doesn't say, as is the case, and as they know is the case, that Captain Fritz took notes and disposed of them or destroyed them. The report says Captain Fritz kept no notes. Well, Sylvan, are you accusing the Warren Commission of uh, rendering a biased, prejudiced report in this investigation? In this one instance, I am accusing the Warren Commission definitely of having failed badly to tell the truth. Well, uh, l let's follow that through uh, for a moment. Uh, you're, you're saying that uh, when the Warren Commission refers to the notes of, uh, that Captain Fritz uh, did not keep, that... Uh, by saying uh, that, uh, they are covering up something. What do you mean by that? Here's what I mean. I mean that the facts are these, and these are irrefutable facts, that this police captain in Dallas questioned this man over a period of 12 hours during two days. That at least at, at some of those times, probably entirely during the first hour of that questioning and possibly during other times, he alone questioned Oswald. That, at, at, that he, he made notes uh, during this interrogation. He himself says that he made such notes, but that he destroyed or disposed of those notes so that we don't have them. They do not exist so far as anyone knows. And what I'm saying is that the Warren Commission did not tell this. It did not say what I have just said. It said he kept no notes and no stenographic records or tapes were made. Well, it doesn't say that he, dis that he made notes or took notes and destroyed them. It says he kept no notes and hopes no one will notice. Well, uh, aren't you being uh, unfair to tag on, for example, uh, what might be the ineptness of Captain Fritz in, in the manner in which he conducted his interrogation in failing to have made notes or kept notes no, and no, try to lay that, excuse me, and try to lay that at the doorstep of the Warren no, wait Commission. A minute, wait a minute, you're, you're not telling the, the story exactly. There is no doubt, and I can prove by, by citing the report, that by citing an appendix to the report, that Fritz made notes. Because there is in a, an appendix a memorandum from Fritz in which he says, this memorandum is based on my, on my no, rough notes. All right, but Sylvan, to be completely accurate, uh, you would have to say there is no doubt that uh, Fritz claimed to have made notes. Well, I suppose that's true, but uh, in this instance, judging from that memorandum and from the fact that he prepared this memorandum in some way, I have no reason to doubt that he made these notes. Well, one thing that what comes to my mind is a police officer who is questioned by people about notes and and the people uh, are aghast at the fact that he kept no notes and he might rectify his statement or he might try to justify his position by saying, yes, I did keep notes, but I disposed of them. And what is, there's some further evidence of notes, as I recall. Yes. It's slim. I, I, would, uh, I would not try to go too far on this reference, but uh, during the last interrogation of Oswald on Sunday, I believe it's the postmaster and the postal inspector Holmes who says that Oswald, uh, irritated at one of Fritz's questions, says, well, uh, you've got my answer there. I've already told you. You've got it in your notes. So that would be a second evidence that there were actually some notes taken by Captain Fritz. 
Well, I don't think there's any question about the fact, as uh, Sylvan has stated in the appendix, Captain Fritz has stated that he had kept some notes, some rough notes, and then finally prepared this official report, so to speak. But uh, to get away from that, I consider well, it minutia. Three times in the night to list all the minutiae on either side of making a case either for or against the commission. So it's a little bit rough on Mr. Fox to, to when he makes one point, to say, well, only that doesn't do it. Let me say, as he has mentioned in his book, there's another instance in which uh, there was destruction of, of uh, rough evidence. That was by Commander Humes, who was the... Uh, pathologist in charge at the autopsy of the president's body at Bethesda Naval Hospital. Commander Humes did keep some of the material he used at the autopsy, namely some drawings, diagrams. But he did destroy, according to his own testimony again, he did destroy notes which he had made at that time, uh, two days later, when he was submitting his more complete report. Now, uh, here is another matter which a uh, I think Mr. Fox's point, at least I, I would side with him to this extent, I would say that a commission ought to alert people to these gaps in the evidence. I'm not accusing Dr. Humes of trying to fool the American public. On the contrary, Dr. Humes is quite explicit that he destroyed his notes. But the commission, at the least, owed people an announcement that there is this gap in the evidence. And I'd say even farther, if there was any reason to to doubt anything in the validity of either the interrogation record from Fritz or the autopsy evidence from Humes that a very thorough commission would even have asked uh, Humes and Fritz to attempt to reconstitute in their testimony what was in these rough notes uh, that was destroyed. So there is a gloss here. While, while, we're, while we're on the subject of Commander Humes, I would like Mr. Kramer to uh, tell us about his experience this week with Commander Humes, because I'd like to comment on that, just parenthetically. Well, uh, when it's appropriate, I'd be glad to come uh, to it. I think uh, it's appropriate well, right now. Fine. Uh, uh, first, uh, I'll, I'll come to that in just a moment. But again, I, I think what's happening here is a misinterpretation of what is routine accepted practice. It is routine. I, in my own experience, have had uh, seen time and again a medical examiner's reports. And it is routine for the medical examiner to make some rough notes as he's conducting the autopsy. That is finally translated into a final report which becomes official. These routine notes are usually destroyed. Now, I see, I, I see no justification or no implication in the fact that Commander Humes testified that he did keep rough notes and then finally prepared his final report. But to go back to notes for just a minute, Jack, to go back to Captain Fritz for a second, I wonder what the uh, implication uh, is being attempted in the fact that Cap Captain Fritz uh, had no notes of his conversation. It would seem to me that if the captain came up with the story that uh, uh, Oswald had admitted to him the killing of the late President Kennedy or of Patrolman Tippett, and say had no signed confession, then, of course, that kind of version uh, might be uh, suspect. Actually, all Captain Fritz has to say, on the basis of his interrogation, essentially, is that Oswald kept reiterating his innocence, so that whether he kept notes or not, I don't see as germane to anything unless Captain Fritz was testifying to anything of any great significance. So then I think that there's really a very serious mistake in what you say, and that is this. That it's true that, the, that these are root, that routinely you don't do these things. But this is not a routine case by any manner of means. These notes, even if they did not have value to the investigation itself, had historical value. As a newspaper man, I'm interested in history, and I find the absence of these notes, the absence of these records, alarming and uncomfortable. They have a historical as well as a, an evidential value, I think. Could, I, I'd like to go farther on that and say that uh, this gives us a good chance to inquire as to what, were the, what was the responsibility of the Commission. Now, it does seem to me that the Commission had not only the responsibility to ascertain what evidence was available, namely to pile uh, to pile high the various factual and witness accounts that were available to it, 
But it had also the responsibility to look behind the evidence. Was there a chance of the abuse or fabrication of evidence on the part of people? Note that Mr. Fox is one of Mr. Fox's charges, which puts this into a context. He's dissatisfied with the commission's proof that there was no conspiracy, or the commission's evidence that there was no conspiracy. Now, one form which a conspiracy would have taken uh, could well have been to fabricate at some point along the line evidence. Now, it should be said here that there were grounds, there are grounds, by the way, which I have tended, as I later studied the case, to reject, but there were very solid grounds for questioning the authenticity of both matters of evidence in this case, both the autopsy evidence and the interrogation evidence. Uh, one of the reasons for questioning the authenticity of the interrogation evidence was that not only do we have a situation in which there was no transcript whatsoever, uh, or no stenographic record and no tape of the uh, interrogations of the prisoner, but also there was a situation in which what records the commission had did not cover all the times which, in which the prisoner was being interrogated. Now, to be very specific on that, uh, the reader of the report is provided as the records of these interrogations only a set of summaries on the part of Fritz, uh, Bookhouse, Hostie, and the FBI agents who were present at most of the interrogations, and some Secret Service agents who were also present at the interrogations, and, and the Postal Inspector Holmes. Now, if one examines closely these records of the interrogations, he discovers that none of the questions and answers which took place between Captain Fritz and the prisoner in the hour before he was joined by FBI representatives on Friday afternoon, none of these questions and answers appear in the record. So that here we have a situation in which even the summary uh, later reports of the interrogation do not cover parts of the interrogation. The commission does not even acknowledge that these are not covered. And as a matter of fact, it is even possible that the commission does, is not aware that its own reports do not cover the entire interrogation sessions. Now, these are important because although Oswald is not claimed to have admitted guilt during these things, he is claimed to have stated certain things which the commission did use in attempting to construct his guilt. Charles Kramer will return to your original suggestion as we start with the question of motive. Well, Sylvan Fox uh, has made uh, the uh, accusation uh, as part of the case uh, that he attempts to build up in criticism of the Warren Commission report that uh, since the Commission found no motive, therefore something or other is supposed to have uh, occurred because of that. I wonder, uh, and uh, Sylvan can answer this uh, when I finish my remarks, whether or not he's suggesting that since the uh, Warren Commission did not uh, conclude what the motive was, that in his opinion, Oswald was not guilty of the assassination of President Kennedy. But actually, if you look at the report, what the commission says, and I'm quoting now, is the commission could not make any definitive determination of Oswald's motives, period. And they go on to explain that motive is often a very difficult thing to establish. They say, however, there are several factors which ought to be considered. For example, they say, one, Oswald's deep-seated resentment of all authority, which was expressed in a hostility toward every society he lived in. Now, we know that Oswald defected from his own country, and that after he got to Russia, he even was unhappy with Russia and finally came back here. So you've got a picture of a rather disturbed man. I think in our experience, uh, in American history experience, there are very few Americans that have ever defected to a foreign country. It's interesting that uh, following World War II, where we had about 10 million soldiers participating, I don't think we had more than Amer a dozen Americans that defected to a foreign country. But even then, it might be said there were some extenuating circumstances, both because at least they were prisoners of war and they had all kinds of threats. Mr. Kramer is very eloquent, but I, I really want to ask him as a trial lawyer, if he, were, if he were trying for the defense and the prosecution presented to him as the 
motive of the man in the dock whom Mr. Kramer is defending, would he, would he accept this kind of argument as, as any kind of proof of yes, motive? I, well, I'd, like to make, I'd like to make one point, too. I think you rather uh, weight your arguments here. I have the, the report in front of me, Mr. Crawford's copy, and uh, I cannot anywhere in the conclusions find anything that suggests that the commission says that motive is difficult to define. Uh, my reading of this here says the commission could not make any definitive determination of Oswald's motives. <clears throat> it has endeavored to isolate factors which contributed to his character and which might have influenced his decision, might have influenced his decision to assassinate President Kennedy. These factors work. It nowhere here says anything about how difficult motive is well, to find because motive is not all that difficult. To well, it can be, but actually, of course, we've got the cart uh, before the horse. We're talking about motive when in this record there is overwhelming proof of the fact that he was the killer. Now, it'll never exonerate a man who, for example, is guilty of a crime simply because you just can't come up with a precise reason that he conducted the killing. But the commission goes on to say that to, to determine the motives, they can be found in his family history. Now, we know, for example, that at the age of 13, uh, Oswald uh, was a problem, a, a, a juvenile delinquent. He was uh, uh, held in the truant, uh, uh, truant schools, the truant courts. He was examined by a psychiatrist at that time who found that he had a disturbed personality. Well, that is not true. Well, you want me to read the, uh, uh, the conclusion uh, of the psychiatrist report in which they say uh, more or less that, I'll find uh, that in general. Well, uh, you don't have to find that. Let me make one point here. Um, I did, I, at no time in the book did I ever suggest that, that because the commission was unable to determine the motive, therefore Oswald is innocent. I do not suggest that, and I, I think in your exposition here, you rather imply that I suggest this. I do not. Uh, however, I do say, not suggest, but declare, that the absence of the motive, the absence of a definition of the motive, is, a, is another shortcoming in the report. Now, it may be to you a minor shortcoming. It may to someone else be a, uh, a major shortcoming. I find it a significant lapse, a significant absence of information. I, what it means is that we will not know, we cannot know, unless further information is provided, why he did this. Now, let me make one further point. You go on to say that although they do not define the motive, although they say they could not make a definitive determination of the motive, they offer certain suggestions. And then you read some of them. His deep-rooted resentment of all authority, which was expressed in the hostility toward every society in which he lived, his inability to enter into meaningful relationships with people. Now, these, this is psychological jargon. This is not a, the, the definition of motive. These conditions, there are many people in the, in the United States and God knows in the world who have deep-rooted resentments toward all authority. There are also even more people who have an inability to enter into meaningful relationships with people. They're, first of all, they are not competent to have made judgments like this. They don't, they're not psychiatrists. They, don't, they didn't have the, the advantage of psychiatric advice on these things. And second of all, these are not conditions which, when added up, result in an assassin. Well, Sylvan, let me read to you uh, uh, from the psychiatrist's report. When he was 13. Time. When he was 13. Well, fine. You said uh, you, you, you took me to task before for some statement I made about the fact that as a lad of 13, a psychiatrist reported that he was a disturbed child. Now, let me just quote. It's just a line or two. Quote, there are indications that he has suffered serious personality damage. Now, that's an exact quote from a psychiatrist uh, of Oswald's personality at the age of 13. Right. Why don't you go on to read the fact well, that let me, it's a doctor. Fact, let me, excuse me. Yeah. Actually, he goes on to say that he is seriously withdrawn, detached, and an emotionally isolated boy of 13. Right. They go on to point out the uh, unhappy relationship that this lad of 13 has with his mother. Now, this is surely the background of somebody who uh, might explode in the future and do the destructive act that he finally did. Oh, well, wait a minute. One, now, one, further point, one further point that you should continue to read, 
This comes from the work of a man by the name of Hartog, who examined this boy at 13 in Youth House in New York. And his ultimate finding, if you continue to read that thing, is that although the boy is disturbed in, all, in this way, and he's withdrawn, and, and this is a rather vague word, disturbed, he says he makes a, a diagnosis, a pathological diagnosis, and says the boy is not psychotic and shows no psychotic symptoms. Now, that's the significant element of that diagnosis because there are, at this moment, perhaps two or three hundred kids in Youth House in New York right now who will fit every symptom you described there. Well, of course there are, and I'm sure that most of these youngsters, and I hope 99% of them, will no doubt resolve their problem. Now, to say that uh, uh, since he was not psychotic, therefore he couldn't have done the act, uh, I can't agree with you at all. Because I to be psychotic by definition means to be mentally unbalanced, and no one has that. ever said that. I didn't say that. Curtis, you had a comment. Uh, I hope you can make it brief because we only have about 45 seconds before we break the news. All right, I'll just say that I hope when we come back why, that we can move to, to uh, some of the other issues here, which I'll specify when I have another chance. All right. Uh, do you mean issues other than motive itself? Well, some of the other aspects of motive and motive and some other matters uh, in connection with motive and ticket and so on. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I think it's... Uh, the question of motive is something that I don't think that we can we can leave after such a brief uh, glance at it, and uh, I think that we could spend just a little bit more time just to determine whether it's possible for someone to murder without motive, without clearly defined motive uh, and conscious motive on the part of the person himself. You're listening to Echoes of Night Talk, a recorded feature. Therefore, we will not accept telephone calls. This is 121 on your AM dial, WCAU, and WCAU-FM, Philadelphia. Now back to Jack McKinney and more Echoes of Night Talk. I think uh, we'll turn to Curtis Crawford, who wanted to pick it up after the uh, news break. May I suggest that at least when I have agreed with Mr. Fox in saying that the commission found no motive, uh, this is what I meant by motive, and maybe if we define our terms, we'll clarify this discussion. I meant a conscious purpose. They were unable to determine what reason Oswald had, whether that reason may have been rational or irrational, what reason was in his mind for doing this. Now, uh, and I felt the commission very scrupulous on this point, in the report at this point, by saying we couldn't determine the motive. That doesn't mean the commission thought there was no motive. As a matter of fact, much of the, of the uh, talk at the time was this man is demented and therefore, by implication, doesn't have a motive. He just acts irrationally. But neither commission contended that he was demented or crazy, nor Captain Fritz, who was the inter chief interrogator. Fritz denied that the man appeared to him to be demented. So there is a problem of finding a reason in his mind. Why, from his point of view, did he assassinate the president? I contend that the commission was unable to find the reason in Oswald's mind for doing this. And that's all I meant by saying the commission had not found the motive. Yes, and let me add that, and I agree with everything that Curtis Crawford has said, uh, let me add that its inability to find this explanation is not an indictment of the commission, but a fact of our, our life here. And not having this motive, we cannot fully understand the assassination. Uh, there exists in the, in the universe somewhere a reason for the act that took place here. We don't know that reason, and because we don't know that reason, we don't really understand this assassination. Well, Sullivan, uh, you're not suggesting simply because we don't know the precise reason, and probably never will know the precise reason, that therefore the Warren Commission or the American public uh, can't justly uh, draw the conclusion that uh, Oswald was the uh, assassinator of President Kennedy. There you go and again, me. misinterpreting what I'm saying. Well, I, I'm not I've never contended that. Well, all right. well, in the final analysis, are we engaging in an exercise in semantics and words, or aren't we trying to, aren't you saying that the Warren Commission 
has left certain questions unanswered. Exactly. Well, and one of them is why Oswald killed Kennedy. That's well, one of fine. The now, and they say to you that we have no definitive answer. But on the $64 question as to whether or not, in their opinion, he was the killer, they say unequivocally yes. yes now, that's the really important well, That is thing. really still in Fox isn't denying that point. I think he, he makes... Uh, he makes what he does out of the inability to establish definitive motive because it it is uh, it's an element that falls into the pattern of the argument that he's building up. Well, and the, point, and the point is again. Let me make the point again that you can't understand an event like this unless you understand why it occurred. I'm not saying they did anything terrible in being unable to 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 reveal the answer to this question. What I'm saying is. The question is not answered, and in its in the absence of an answer to this question, we do do not really understand what happened. Yes, but that's not entirely true. If you want to say that in not answering you this, we do not know the precise motive, I will agree with you. But they do clearly point out, and they list at least five suggested areas that might have contributed towards the motivation of the act. For example. Uh, aside from his deep-seated resentment, they list his capacity for violence as evidenced by his attempt to kill General Walker. Now, they point to that as one of the suggested patterns of his background. And their final conclusion of it is this, quote, each of these contributed to his capacity to risk all in cruel and irresponsible action. All, now, all, all that says to me is that the man possibly with the man was capable of committing the crime. That's all. And I wouldn't argue with that for a minute. Well, I yes. agree completely that the man was capable of committing crime. Indeed, I believe he committed it. Well, might but, not. But I still do not, from that or anything else in here, find out why he did it. I think one reason I wanted to add some matters of perspective is that this this gap in the in what the commission was able to discover is not alone in this area. For instance. One of the things that interested many of us as we looked into this situation is, why did he kill Tippett? Uh, one of the reasons it gave a problem is that the very first motive that we all assumed as we were listening to the radio and watching it on TV was that there had been some kind of altercation between an escaping criminal, Oswald, and an officer who was trying to run him down and catch him. But uh, this turned out, as we later got more of the facts, not to have been the case. The only description we have of the encounter between Oswald and Tippett, which practically every listener must be terribly familiar with, is a description based on a witness named Helen Markham. And her description is that, <coughs> excuse me, her description is that a man is walking casually, leisurely, down a street, a man she identifies as Oswald. A police car is coming slowly up beside him. Uh, the uh, police car, uh, identified later as the car of Tippett, with Tippett inside. Uh, the police car pulls up beside the man. The man comes over to the car. Mrs. Markham is not clear as to whether he was called over to the car or just walks over to the car at a gesture or why he comes over to the car. Uh, the man, uh, standing up, leans uh, partway in the window of the car, an appearance of very leisurely conversation. Mrs. Markham said on the stand that she assumed that they were talking about some difficulty which had arisen in an apartment house, and certainly saw no indication of animosity or fear between the officer and the man. Then, after a short conversation, the officer, who is sitting in the driver's seat, gets out the left-hand side of the car and walks around to the front left wheel of the car, uh, apparently walking around to meet the man, uh, whereupon the man, according to her testimony, level, uh, pulls out a pistol and shoots across the hood of the car at the officer and shoots him dead. Now, uh, the evidence indicated by how the, the position of the body indicates that, that uh, the hand of the officer had only reached the holster of the gun by the time motion stopped. So... Uh, this officer had apparently got out of the car without even drawing his gun. Uh, so uh, not uh, acting as if he had anything to fear from this man whom he had stopped. So there is one, the problem of why did he stop this man, which we'll come to later after some more discussion. 
But our immediate problem is, why did Oswald shoot this man? Uh, he is, uh, this is not an escape situation. Well, do you agree, uh, leaving motive alone for a moment, uh, in the past the critics of the Warren Commission report have been saying that uh, the evidence as to the shooting of uh, Officer Tippett uh, by Oswald is a matter in dispute. Now, can we get some agreement that whatever the motivation for the moment, that uh, Oswald uh, did shoot and kill Officer Tippett. What do you say about that, Curtis? I think the evidence is very, very strong that he did shoot and kill Officer Tippett. What do you yes, have to I say agree about with it. that. I All was right. perfectly prepared to accept the idea right. that he killed Tippett, but I, we have to go back now to the more important and intriguing question, why? Well, uh, what you call intriguing, uh, I, I'm sure in criminology you would find uh, no difficulty of solution. Uh, if, in fact, as uh, I'm convinced and the Warren Commission is convinced, and I'm sure the Amer vast American public is, that the assassinator of President Kennedy was Oswald, he certainly has enough uh, reason for uh, killing or shooting somebody who's uh, about possibly to apprehend him. Now, wait a minute. Markham, let me just finish, please. Mrs. Markham is no uh, answer to the problem. We know that at 12.44 p.m., which would be roughly uh, a half hour before the shooting of, uh, 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 of Tippett by Oswald, that he had received a message, white male, approximately 30, slender bill, height, 5 foot 10 inches, weight 165, wanted as a suspect in the assassination of President Kennedy. Now that information Patrolman Tippett had prior to the interview or prior to the time when he saw uh, Oswald. I think yes. Silverman has a point yes. on this. This is fine. This works beautifully until you consider another incident that took place only a short time earlier. You say that there's not, not, it's not difficult to understand that he shot Tippett because he expected to be arrested, because he was confronted with the, the possibility of being arrested. And that makes sense, except when you consider this incident. But a short time earlier, Oswald allegedly, from the description that, that the Warren, Warren Commission provides, came downstairs from the sixth floor of the book depository, <clears throat> walked across the second floor, and there encountered a policeman by the name of Marion Baker, who stopped him at the point of a gun, who put the pistol right up against his, his body, and said, who are you? And, and Oswald told him, and then at this point, Roy Truly, the superintendent of the book depository, arrived at the side of Baker and said, oh, this man is all right, he works here. Now, in that situation, only a matter of minutes after, the, after Oswald shot Kennedy, a situation when he could easily be understood to be excited, to be uneasy, to be uh, jittery and, and precipitous in his action, he's faced by a policeman at the point of a gun, and he does nothing. Well, there's a good reason he had no gun on him at that time. But he doesn't so even try to fight well, or run no or any. Well, there's no reason to run because at that point, uh, the superintendent truly had uh, intervened and said, oh, yes, he's one of the men who work here. That whole incident took one second because the police officer had heard some shots coming from the top floors of this building, and he was in a hurry to get up to the top. This took place on the second floor. And as the testimony is, that immediately then, the patrolman truly uh, 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 ran upstairs. I think, I think there are some difficulties with that example, also from the fact that, um, also from the fact that there are a lot of other people present, and any, any violence that, that Oswald might have tried against the policeman, even if he would got away with it in regard to the policeman, would have reflected in terms of the reactions of others. But I do believe that, that it is important to study the fact and this is something also that we didn't know right after, right at the time, and that is that it turns out that Oswald made no concerted effort to escape. Uh, now, he did leave the area of the depository, to be sure, but how many people realize that the first thing he did was to get on a bus, according to testimony, which would have brought him right back by the depository? Now, he did get off of that bus when the bus got into heavy traffic and ceased to move. But then what did he do? He went down by the Greyhound bus station. Uh, the bus station, by the way, takes you right out of town if you want to go. And one of the odd things is that he didn't attempt to escape town. Here is a man, let's assume for the moment, which I, I agree with. I think he shot the president. 
All right, let's assume that's true. He has just shot the president. Uh, I know if I shot the president, I would assume that I'd be killed on the spot. I always remember Huey Long's death, and I always assume that, that if one's going to do this, it's like a kamikaze raid, he doesn't get away. So I'd have been terrifically surprised. Here I am, 15 minutes later, scot-free. They're confused as the Dickens over there. I can get away. Here's the Greyhound bus station. I've got money in my pocket. I'll leave. Now Oswald, not Oswald, he gets into a taxi cab. As a matter of fact, he even suggests to the taxi driver when another woman begins to knock on the window, oh, take her. Maybe she's in a hurry. Well, the taxi cab driver goes ahead and uh, takes Oswald. And where does he go? He goes out to his rooming house and then uh, goes into his rooming house and, and comes out. And the next we find him is walking at a leisurely rate down 10th Street, wasn't it? 10th, 10th Street. Now, here is a man who doesn't make any very calculated or concerted effort to escape. And that's what I meant by saying, since I don't see any actions indicating an effort to escape, the motivation of killing the policeman as someone barring an escape doesn't make too much sense. The speculation that he killed Tippett because Tippett was barring his escape doesn't make much sense to me because he does not act like a man attempting to escape. So then what are your, uh, what are your speculations on, on the pattern of his behavior afterwards? Do you think it was with purpose? Well, uh, I think there are possible suggestions there that, that he was acting with some kind of purpose. Uh, this is another element uh, which is in doubt. Uh, we don't know where he was going when all this was going on. We have no idea at any point. The, the Warren Commission does a beautifully meticulous job, I think, of tracing his movements during that period, from the moment he left the book depository to the moment he was captured in the movie theater. But what it doesn't tell us is, where was he going? Why did he go home and change his jacket and pick up a gun? And why did he then leave his house and head somewhere? Where was he going? Well, Jack, uh, I think uh, that uh, too much is being asked of the Warren Commission. Uh, they, uh, in one breath, uh, the answers they give to the uh, big questions uh, uh, are uh, more or less being accepted now. And yet uh, you want to know, you want every I uh, dotted and every T crossed. Uh, you want to know, uh, you want the Warren Commission to tell you uh, where was Oswald going at the time when he left the house after picking up the gun. Well, the only one who could answer that uh, truthfully uh, is Oswald. Now, if you want speculation, I'm sure the Warren Commission or anyone else could give you some thesis or theme. But they tried to nail down and avoid speculation. When they didn't have a motive, a precise motive, they stated that. They said, we think we know the reason, but we're not sure. And in the same breath, uh, I, I think it's a tribute to the commission report that it has, uh, as a competent uh, investigative body, they stayed within the area where they could give you answers. And when they had no answers, they either said so or left it alone. But these, these are not trivial questions, let's remember. The question of where Oswald was going, if we knew the answer, might reveal a tremendous amount about what was happening here. In the same way that the question of why he acted as he did would certainly reveal a great deal about what was actually going on here. Curtis, I think it's important to remember that the Warren Commission set itself not just the task of discovering whether it was indeed Oswald who had fired the shot, but it also set the task of discovering whether he had done so alone, whether he had acted alone. And as I understand, the, the point of the, the reason I have been stressing these gaps as to our knowledge of the reason Oswald killed the president and the reason he killed Tippett and the reason Tippett stopped him, I want to uh, expand on that a little bit, is because these are both relevant to attempting to discover whether Oswald acted, acted alone. For instance, was Oswald heading for a rendezvous with Ruby in that area? Is a valid question, it seems to me. Or was Oswald heading for a rendezvous with Tippett? Yes, may this I? It seems to me is, is a valid question. May I, I, can ask may I, I can break in another one. valid question? Was he heading for a, val a, a rendezvous with Castro? You know, there's no limit 
to the number of people who you say he was going to have around him. Now wait, now wait, now wait. That's not quite right because there are there are other uh, factors which indicate the possibility of the two runs no, that, right. that uh, Curtis right. just suggested. There is yes. no possibility that points to a run. That's reducing no, the absurd. Well, that's right. a, well, right. the point is it reaches the absurd when, when you try to say uh, who was he uh, going to meet. Well, the question is, who is he going to meet, if anyone? Now, I agree that if you start off on the basis that he was going to meet someone, if there was any proof that he was going to meet someone, then it might have been Ruby, it might have been Tippett, it might have been anyone you want to think of. But in the absence of any proof that he was going to meet anyone, I say simply now to inject the name of Ruby as the person, or Tippett, or anyone else you w wish to, is unfair. Now, on a matter of conspiracy, the Warren Commission was very definitive and very clear-cut. They say unequivocally that in their opinion, there is no evidence of any conspiracy. Now, they, they do admit, however, that proving the fact that no one else was implicated is almost impossible. Well, well I can say this before uh, I turn it to you, Sylvan, that uh, up to this very moment, uh, Curtis has, I think, impressed all of us with his objectivity and the fact that uh, the response of the responsibility of his manner in the way that he is, and it was uh, Curtis who brought up the names of, uh, brought up the two possibilities, uh, rendezvous with Ruby or rendezvous with, uh, with uh, Tippett. So I don't think that uh, we can say that uh, Curtis has been unfair in any way. Oh, I, I didn't mean it in any sense of unfairness, Jack. I was merely uh, expressing the point of view that if you want to speculate, then there's no limit to where your mind can wander. For example, if, if you talk in terms of uh, who might have assisted him, uh, you can go be and say maybe a man from Mars was part of All the right, plan. There's no limit about the mind. limits. We're talking about uh, uh, immediate uh, possibilities. Let's examine them. Right, children. right. This is, this is foolishness to uh, talk about, uh, say that, that certain conditions are the same as, as uh, conditions that are impossibly remote. The fact is that the shooting of uh, Tippett occurred very close by to uh, Ruby's house, a point, incidentally, which the Warren Commission in no place mentions. It mentions, it makes a point How of close saying, by? How close? a matter of three bucks, a matter of three bucks. Car drove up in front of the house at the very moment that Oswald was there. Right, we didn't introduce this yes. before, and I think it's uh, valid that you bring it up yes. now. I, and, met, I let, mentioned this briefly I, before. I thought you had, and I wanted to, to make sure it was clear in our listeners' minds what was involved here. Now, Mrs. Roberts' testimony is that at about 1 o'clock, uh, thereabouts, Oswald was inside changing clothes, and that at that time a police car drove up with two men in it, and a number of which she remembered as something like 106 or 107. It had a, the number apparently, as it stated in her mind, had a couple of big circles in it. Now, Mrs. Roberts maintained this. She said that uh, there was a context for her, that uh, policemen, there was a car that fairly frequently came up to the house involving friends or acquaintances of hers. She looked to be sure she thought maybe it was these acquaintances, it turned out not to be the case. She did not recognize either the number or the car, or the people in the car. Uh, the horn was honked a couple of times, and then after a few instants, the car drove away. Now, uh, something that, this is mentioned in Mr. Fox's book, but something he does not mention is the number which was on Tippett's car. You remember what that number was? Ten. Ten. There is a circle in 10. There is also a long mark in 10. I'm not saying that this is proof by any manner of means. I'm not saying this is proof that it's Tippett's car, but it seems to me that an alert commission should have faced the possibility that this was Tippett's car. All right, I'd like to remind our listeners, this is 121 on your AM dial, WCAU and WCAU-FM in Philadelphia. Sylvan? Yes, I'd like to add to that. Uh, I, I didn't mention the Tippett car because I myself was very uncertain about whether this was substantial enough connection, that is the 10 and the 107 or the 106. However, the, the, another omission in the report is very significant in this context here because the commission tells us this whole story in detail, 
or at least it's in the testimony. I'm not sure whether it is in the report now that I think about it, but it is in the testimony anyway. And the commission describes, the, the testimony describes the whole business, but the commission at no point ever uh, resolves this point, that an investigation was undertaken to determine what this car was. And remember, this car was there during a three-minute period when Oswald was in the house. He was not there longer than three minutes, and yet this car was there at that time. The commission investigated this, that is, the FBI investigated for the commission, and they found that car 106 was at the book depository, as was car, 107, uh, as was car 207. But 170 and 107 had been sold in April of 1963. Now, what they do not tell us is, to whom were these cars sold? What became of these cars? Seems to me, as I pointed out in the book, that in any kind of, uh, of uh, conspiratorial arrangement that was going on, if indeed one was, this would be a very ideal situation to, to use an, a, a, an accepted police car of the Dallas Police Force and an, carrying a number which had not been reassigned to any other car so there could be no conflict and to have this car moving about the city. A further point that could have been explored was that the practice of the Dallas Police Department in disposing of their old vehicles, was it the practice of the Dallas Police Department to do what most municipalities do, and that is remove insignia before the sale? Even the removal of insignia before the sale would prove nothing, because that insignia could easily be restored. So, right. are you uh, suggesting that uh, uh, this uh, testimony uh, might be indicative of... Uh, uh, an allegiance or an alliance between uh, Tippett and Oswald? No, and I'm not. The direction not, of it. I, I didn't get the point. I'm not making I know any it's a supposition, but what, what is it? What is the, the direction you're suggesting? I'm, I'm saying, the one who brought it up. Oh, why don't I respond to Curtis? And to I'll ask I you. So. Uh, are you then suggesting it as a, a conceivable or possible theory of some uh, alliance between Tippett and uh, Oswald? If I had been a member of the commission. I would have felt that there was sufficient question as to the uh, encounter between Oswald and Tippett to investigate the hypothesis that they had known each other before. Now, and uh, this is why I tied that in. Oh, by the way, I, I tend to question that Mrs. Roberts ever saw this. Well, of course. I, I'm, I'm not saying that because a witness says something, therefore I know it to be true. Quite on the contrary. But I brought it up. Because my point was that I think the commission should have investigated the hypothesis that where Oswald was going was to meet Tippett. Well, Curtis, you do know, of course, that the commission did investigate whether or not Tippett and Oswald ever knew each other. And they state that based on our exhaustive investigation, we find no evidence of the fact that they ever knew each other. Now, if to follow your thesis for a moment that whether they knew each other, at least no evidence, still maybe there was some alliance of some kind, what motivation then would Oswald have for killing the one person who might be his accomplice and possibly help him? Well, this, raise motivation. This, if we're going to speculate, this one's an easy one. If it turned out that uh, if Oswald had been part of a conspiracy which had assured him of an escape, and he is, and he is. If he will meet Tippett, he will be driven out of town. And Tippett, on the contrary, says, <laughs> "Sorry, fella, uh, you've done it. Now you're in the soup." There would be motivation to slay. Well, and finally, do you think there's anything to the theory, or is it just uh, theory? No, this one, this, uh, the one thing about the theory is that it does explain several facts which the commission is unable to explain. Uh, namely, why Tippett stopped in the first place, and secondly, why Oswald shot him. Now, I would agree, you, uh, both, both those problems, which the Commission leaves completely unexplained, are explained by the theory I suggest. I agree that there are things that the Commission did which would hurt that theory. Namely, that the Commission did conduct a fairly extensive investigation. I was not satisfied that it was extensive enough, but it was a fairly extensive investigation of the possibilities of previous encounters between Oswald and Tippett. But as you say yourself, it was not necessary that the man who had been designated by our hypothetical conspiracy should have been a, to, to drive Oswald out of town, should have been uh, known to him in advance. 
Let me say one further thing to make clear a point that I don't think uh, the audience has had a chance to to have clear yet. Uh, why to to clarify why I am bothered about Tippett's stopping Oswald? You are perfectly right that Tippett had heard over the police radio at 12:44 a description of a man who somewhat resembled Oswald. But if one attends to that description, about 30 somewhere around 5'8 to 5'10, about 150 to 165 pounds, he has the description of the average male. Think about that age, that weight, and that height. Now add to this the fact that I have been through the radio log carefully, and I would say that there is no other circumstance anywhere in Dallas of the police, of a policeman in a car, stopping one man in such circumstances. There was a guy stopped who was very drunk and who was carrying on and who looked as if he might have been violent. There were guys picked up in the railroad yards, uh, apparently bums who were, who were parked in those, in those cars there. But nowhere else in Dallas did any policeman drive up to a man just walking along the street, uh, looking like every other, looking like the average male, and stop this guy. You know what the answer might, might be. Well, wait a minute. There's, no, there's no point in, in saying what the answer well, might be. Let me just quote this. Uh, his wife, when she saw him, Oswald, in prison the next day, and uh, uh, assured him, as he assured her, that he was innocent, and uh, she uh, sort of commiserated with him uh, in saying, well, uh, I'm sure it'll all work out. But then she remarks, he says, you know, in his eyes, he had the fear of guilt. Do you know which direction he was walking in, Mr. Kramer? You know where he was going? The police car came out from behind him. There's really no, no, no. I, 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 I was just no, wait, wait. <laughs> One other point. The fact is also that, that in this encounter with Tippett, there isn't anything about it that suggests any kind of violence at all. It's a perfectly in, incongruous encounter. And it, 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 it has no suggestion of any violence at all. And there's nothing in this incident at all that explains what happened here. For instance, well, if Tippett, if, if the original hypothesis that we all accepted in the first day was correct, namely that Tippett had stopped this man because he suspected him, on what, how can we possibly explain uh, an officer experienced dealing with a man who, whom he suspects as violent enough to kill the President of the United States, uh, getting up, exposing himself, walking out of his car without even his gun drawn. Right. Or, I, may I suggest one yeah. thing to you, Curtis? Uh, you've been through the radio logs, as you said, do you know the, the complete text of the message? Uh, yes. you, you yeah. did, and yeah. In other words, uh, yeah. would Tippett have been advised to that the subject may be armed and approach with caution. Uh, the, the message does not, the message includes the weapon, as a matter of fact, and practically all the people who were stopped were stopped because they possessed a rifle. The, the alarm includes the description I gave plus a weapon. Right. Mm -hmm. And I know that this would be even less reason for stopping this man who was obviously right. not carrying a rifle. Not only did Tippett not draw his gun when he, when he got out of that car, but he was alone. He was, he, he presumably, to use your account, suspected this man of being the assassin of the President of the United States. Yet he did not, and he was driving up behind him, yet he did not say on the radio at any time, I have spotted a man that fits the description I am going to investigate as most police would do under such conditions. They would radio to the dispatcher and say, I, am, I have spotted a suspect, I am going to investigate. He's alone in the car. Curtis, what was uh, Tippett's last radio contact with uh, his Radio Central, Police Radio Central, before the time of his encounter with Oswald? Well, uh, there is about, at, at around 12.45, give or take a few minutes, there are instructions to Tippett and a fellow patrol and a, another cruiser to move into the Oak Cliff area and to be alert for any emergency. A few minutes later, uh, the dispatcher checks to find out whether uh, Tippett is there, 
and Tippett reports that he is there. Yes, there's one more little element, and that is that, 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 as I recall, there's an attempt to raise Tippett on the radio at 1 o'clock, and it's unsuccessful. You that's correct. That? That's correct. And that's very interesting, too, in, in the context of what Curtis said, because, remember, at 1 o'clock, this police car was outside of uh, Oswald's house. But also, a significant point that we can't overlook is the fact that Tippett was ordered to be in the Oak Cliff section. No doubt about it. Which in itself is rather strange, by the way, because most of the cars had been ordered either to the book depository or had been told to remain on their own station. You know, there's now, a funny story about this, which I, I just can't, I just can't keep from telling about. Um, the commission had available for the first four or five months of the investigation a transcript of the radio log provided by dispatcher Hensley, who was one of the dispatchers on the radio that day. Uh, this transcript is printed in full in the documents of the commission, and upon investigating that transcript, I discovered that it was uh, very much edited, uh, very much curved, shortened, abridged. Uh, I was able to discover that because it turned out that there is a no there are two other copies of the Dallas radio log transcripts which are much fuller versions. But the interesting story is why uh, the commission went after the second. Well, it, in the first transcript, there were no orders to tip it to move into Oak Cliff. And so, what the, the funny part one of the funny parts is. There then began a long series of depositions asking Dallas police officers. Why in the heck Tippett had gone to Oak Cliff because this was not the area he was supposed to patrol. And you should see all the ingenuous attempts to explain this. Well, as a matter of fact, it's the shortest way to the Texas School Book Depository, which it really isn't. Well, as a matter of fact, Tippett would realize that the Oak Cliff cops had gone to the, to the building, so he would have moved into Oak Cliff to cover. Well, all sorts of rationalizations that proved uh, beside the point when they turned up the second full transcript in which this, these orders were located. But of course, a person suspicious of the possibility that at least that some people in the police staff were not dealing squarely would have been, it seems to me, terribly upset by a radio log which is turned over to the commission as the radio log. Hensley didn't say this is an abridged copy, I assure you. Hensley said, this log has every import, every statement connected with the assassination is in this log. And as a matter of fact, practically all of the questioning by the commission of police officers was based on this abridged radio log. I should add further that there are some interesting discrepancies between the abridged log and the real, and the fuller logs not only in terms of the latter are fuller, but there are some places in which what is said in the earlier log is changed in the later log, or vice versa. Well, this, I think, is an important point to establish, at least uh, in opinion. Uh, you use the term a bridge. Uh, could it have been that the, the shorter form was the latest or the last form, and the earlier forms were exactly as said, or could it be the other way around, that the, uh, the uh, what you refer to as the abridged form was the first form, and the others were merely amplified forms with uh, added data after the fact? Well, uh, there, are, there are two problems here. One discrepancy. <laughs> let, me, let me be clear on one thing. There is no question that what the abridged form is that which was turned over to the commission first. The abridged form is turned is prepared by Hensley in early December of 1963, given to the chief of police Curry in December and transmitted to the commission in late December, all of 1963. The commission, in questioning Hensley in March, uh, asks him to confirm this log, which he does. So that uh, there is no question but what the what I have called the abridged form comes to the commission early whereas the other forms come, there's a letter of transmittal for the, the fuller form in late March. Mm -hmm. Now, as to the subtler question, which may be also involved in what you've said, if there are differences, what is the explanation of the differences? Were things uh, uh, cut from at first or added later? Uh, that is stickier to decide. On one thing, there seems to be no question but what there is a lot of material which was in the 
that, that there's a lot of that there is cutting. Uh, a lot of it is just editing. Hensley, in transcribing, seems to be expressing, trying to express in eight words what what the real log expresses in twelve or in twenty, what the real log does in twenty-five. There are many matters in the later log which uh, you would expect Hensley to omit. Uh, calls which did not have to do with the assassination. But there are a fairly significant number of calls which do have to do with the assassination, which appear in the later log and do not appear in the earlier log. And there are occasional times in which the version in the one log disagrees with the version in the later log. And I'll add just one further thing. There is a terrible confusion in the abridgment if we assume, as I, as I tend to, you can tell by the way I'm talking about it, that the later log is, is basically the valid one. There are several places, uh, well, actually there are, there are two logs, one for channel number one and one for channel number two. Hensley bollocks his thing so badly that he makes it appear that what was really channel one is from about halfway going, channel two. So there is, is really the most serious kind of confusion operating here uh, since the commission bases a great deal of its questioning on the first log. And, and this is one of the funny parts, since, since a lot of the cops have clearly to remind themselves of what happened that day, have studied that first log, and they answer in terms of that first log, and when it turns out that the first log is incorrect in certain, attributing certain calls to certain cops, it turns out that cops have testified to being where they couldn't possibly have been if the later log is correct. But the possibility does enter because of these matters. Uh, things could have been added to the radio log between the first uh, edition and the second. That possibility is certainly there. It, Curtis Crawford uh, brought up two names, the possibilities, actually, of two rendezvous. One would have been with uh, the possibility, and that's all we're dealing with, the possibility of a rendezvous with Officer Tippett and also the possibility of a rendezvous with Jack Ruby. I'd like to turn to you on the latter possibility, Sylvan Fox. Well, as I mentioned before, the uh, that factor of, uh, of uh, Ruby's proximity to uh, the scene of the Tippett shooting is interesting and not pointed out in the report. But uh, to go uh, a step further with this thing, uh, I think Ruby's key role is, uh, is worth exploring a little bit. Uh, the thing that intrigued me most about uh, the whole Ruby episode was his ability to appear in the police station at exactly the right moment. And let me just review for a minute uh, what took place here. Uh, this was Sunday morning, uh, November 24th. Uh, Oswald was in custody and he was to be moved from the Dallas police station where he had been held since the uh, afternoon of the assassination to the county jail. Uh, on Saturday night, the uh, chief of police of Dallas told reporters that if they came back to the police station at about 10 o'clock, they would be there in time to miss nothing, which suggested to all the reporters who were present that 10 o'clock would be about the time of the move. Before 10 o'clock that Sunday morning, the uh, Dallas police station was searched thoroughly. They went through the air ducts, they examined the cars, they closed off the doors. They really sealed this building off. Uh, the, the reporters were allowed in after the search, and there were about four, 30 or 40 reporters present, plus about 70 policemen. The, uh, they then waited for about an hour and a half. Jack Ruby did not show up at 10 o'clock. At 10 o'clock, Jack Ruby was still in his apartment a good distance away. But sometime around 11 o'clock, he drove downtown. He stopped at a Western Union office across the street from the police station and sent a $25 money order to an employee of his. Then he walked across the street and presumably, to believe the commission, down a ramp into the basement of the police station. He arrived there 
sometime around 11.17, I think was the, the, the actual time. No more, says the commission, than three minutes either way, three minutes before. And within those three minutes, he shot Ruby. Uh, he shot Oswald. Now, the question arises, how did he time this thing so perfectly? He didn't arrive 10 minutes or 15 minutes too soon so that he would have had to wait around and might have been spotted because he was an unauthorized person in the building. He didn't arrive five or 10 minutes too late so that he missed this transfer. He arrived within a three minute span of the time of the move so that he was able to, f to fire the gun and kill uh, Oswald. Now, the commission can't explain this either. It can't explain how he did this, doesn't know. It, nor can it explain how he got into the building. It doesn't know that either. It says presumably he got into the building by walking down the main street lamp, but it says this only because this is what he said. There is all kinds of, contra of, of uh, co uh, contrasted evidence, contradictory evidence, against that thesis. Um, there, are, there is police testimony which says that uh, from a guard who was posted at this ramp who says no one entered that ramp. There, a car drove up at exactly the time that Ruby must have entered if indeed he entered that ramp, and they did not see Ruby. They knew Ruby, and they did not see him there. So there is all of this testimony that says he didn't enter by that Main Street ramp, yet the commission says, well, he couldn't have entered any other way. So he must have entered by the Main Street ramp. Jack, uh, first of all, I think Sylvan was an error before when he said that uh, Jack Ruby lived just a few blocks away from uh, where Oswald lived. Is that the state? No, no, no. no said from where the shooting, shooting occurred. Oh, excuse me. Because actually they lived uh, considerable oh, distance sure apart. Oh, no one now, uh, I think uh, the, the commission uh, deals uh, with this problem and gave the answer as you indicated. Now, we all know that on Friday night, Jack Ruby was in the police station. As a matter of fact, he was present at the time when uh, a kind of a press conference was arranged by the police Friday night, the night of the shooting. Uh, and uh, somehow or other, Jack Ruby was admittedly there. Now, he didn't belong there in the first place. Uh, it's obvious that security both on Friday and Sunday uh, was uh, inadequate. That's Is it not so? What's that? The commission itself makes a very strong point of saying that although things were pretty wild in the afternoon of Friday and even the night of Friday, by Sunday it had all been thoroughly tied down. And if you look at the descriptions, the testimony and the description in the report of how carefully this room was searched and how what meticulous care was taken to seal this room off, you, you would not say that the, that the security was, was shoddy. Well, it obviously had to be shoddy because whether Ruby was there for three minutes or three hours, the fact remains that he physically was there. This isn't a case where somebody says Ruby wasn't there and didn't shoot Oswald. The fact is he was on the premises, which means that somehow along the way he managed to get in. And I don't think it makes any difference whether you believe the three-minute story or you want to say he was there for hours. In any event, he didn't belong there, and if the police put, had the kind of security they should have had, why he shouldn't have been there in the first place? Unless they were, unless he was allowed. Isn't there. this uh, what, it, uh, what I was going to say? Uh, isn't this an example of the uh, commission sealing itself off from the possibility by by saying that presumably, using the only presumption, or stating only one presumption, presumably he walked down the main ramp. They seal off the possibility that he was admitted. Right. Well, it, the fact of the matter is that from the commission's point of view, they don't feel that point one way or the other is of any great significance. The chances are, uh, conceitedly, he might have been admitted. All the policemen knew him. He was one of these uh, flunkies uh, that would hang around the police station. The fact remains he was there Friday night. It would be significant if, as Sylvan says, they had tightened it down by Sunday and he was still admitted. Yes, but the fact remains then that uh, uh, we know, for example, that there was uh, dozens and dozens of newspaper men. Now, we know that uh, security uh, in this kind of situation, it's one thing to limit uh, the situation to police officers only. Once you admit, how many were there? I think 70? 30 to 40 was well, the count. Well, all right. we'll take the count of 30 to 40. 70 policemen. All right, 30 to 40 uh, 
a newspaper man with 70 police officers. You've got a mob present. Yes, and in one mean. way or another, now whether it was, the point is whether Ruby got in because some police officer he knew let him go in improperly, or whether he got in uh, 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 behind the back of some police officer, I don't think is terribly important uh, and indicative of anything in particular. Right, the fact that was there. Important. My I, point. I like the it's question of how this man got into that building, I think, is terribly important because it again, in, again, in order to understand what happened, we have to understand how he got in there. If he got in there through collusion with a member of the police force or with other, many members of the police force, then the possibility has to exist that he got in there as part of a conspiracy. To do what? To kill Oswald, which is exactly what he well, did. Uh, you, you know, the theory, that one of the theories advanced is that Ruby killed Oswald to seal his lips. Uh, other uh, writers have said it. Some of the foreign authors have suggested that as a possible theory. But uh, what I never could understand about that theory is this. Oswald at least maintained his innocence all the time. He kept saying to the police, I didn't do it. And it's conceivable that in the event of a trial, uh, uh, if a jury believed that, well, he starts off with the presumption of innocence, the case must be proven against him beyond a reasonable doubt, and it's conceivable, I think unlikely, that uh, he might have been acquitted. But surely Ruby, having performed the execution in the presence of, uh, you might say, the whole country, stood very little chance of escaping. Curtis, uh, oh. what you just said is interesting because it's almost the whole truth, but not quite. There, was a, there, there were times when Oswald said, I'm a patsy. As a matter of fact, one of those times was at the close of his television interview and that uh, television interview, that part of it has been cut from the Warren, from the transcript of the Oswald television interview that appears in the documents. But I'd like to add something to this problem of the, the coincidence the coincident precision at which Ruby and I will take that up later. I think we better uh, take that up after the news, and I must fit this message in now. When uh, Roy Truly, the boss, of, one of the bosses of the depository, came up to him with Oswald's description as a man who is missing, and uh, 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 Fitz's actions were at least a little strange. Instead of immediately sending out an alarm to get Oswald, pick up, have Oswald picked up, since Truly had come up to him and said, "This employee is missing, and I've seen him in questionable circumstances," uh, Fritz did nothing immediately about it except go to police headquarters saying to somebody, I think I'll go out to Irving Street and look this guy up. Uh, a strangely slow way of dealing with a man who may be right this moment on a Greyhound bus or on a plane and getting out of the city for, for whom uh, tremendous speed is necessary. But not at all inconsistent in the notion that uh, he knew what was going on, knew Oswald was his man, and knew where to find him. Now, this is some evidence against. I'm sorry to have made so much out of this point. I will only say that there is some, there's some evidence for Fritz in this case. And that is, one, he, if he intended to silence Oswald, if he was part of a plot to silence Oswald, his behavior as interrogator is strange because he allowed a great number of people during the course of those two days to, part, to be present at the time of the interrogation. And he even seems to have left Oswald alone in his own, excuse me, alone in terms of, in his own terms. He, Fritz, left Oswald in Fritz's office in the presence of various policemen when Fritz was himself not there. And if Oswald had something crucial to say, which he could have revealed once Fritz had left, so to speak, he would think there was considerable time for him to have done this. Plus the fact that Fritz agreed to the TV conference in which Oswald was shown to the whole country alive, and if, if he could at that moment have announced uh, some crucial fact which uh, they wanted to silence him about, uh, and these are reasons why I have tended on balance to say I don't think Fritz could have been part of such a cover-up, but you see why uh, it's a question. So these, uh, uh, this problem uh, bothered me uh, also, and uh, I, I have to say that I, that I'd find, I find on balance the evidence uh, against Fritz heavier than the evidence for him. The reason I say that is that I think that that he couldn't prevent the presence of the FBI men and the Secret Service men in the interrogation. This would have been impossible for him to do. Uh, they had to be there. 
because this was, after all, a crime of the magnitude of this assassination. But uh, he could have cut the number of people way down. Well, that would not have changed the situation much, though, I think. He, 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 whether there were many FBI and, and Secret Service men present or a few, uh, the same result would have uh, would have accrued. But uh, and all well, more, Fritz had the opportunity of of. Uh, no, I would draw the argument if it's not valid. Excuse me. Well, also the the uh, the 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 whole context of the of the television interview, the the questioning, does not at all persuade me that uh, that it's. Uh, that he's completely out of the uh, out of the picture. Well, insofar as I'd like to make one point, I think that uh, uh, Curtis makes uh, his arguments uh, on the pro side that uh, are a little bit weighted with just one possibility. The possibility, it seems to me, I could be wrong. The possibility that uh, that Fritz was uh, safeguarding uh, any possibility of. Uh, Oswald blurting something out and having come so far and then just wanting to to uh, confess himself to everyone. But uh, on the other hand, uh, you can take your same positive arguments and consider the possibility that Fritz through this could have acted as the the bastion, the the, uh, the foundation of strength that kept Oswald going. He was in constant rapport with Oswald. And the fact that uh, if if any one outside external force could have could have uh, kept uh, Oswald's composure as it as as Oswald himself obviously maintained it, then the one outside external influence would have been Fritz himself. The the, uh, the whole idea of that first hour of the interrogation is is really crucial here because. If we knew what was said during that first hour, when Fritz and Oswald were alone, we would then, I think, better understand Oswald's behavior between then and the time he was shot, in public and in private, and we would better understand Fritz's behavior. I'd like, I'd like to respond to Mr. McKinney's uh, comment, because I think perhaps he and I are seeing what the reasons might be behind this in, in a somewhat different way. I was assuming that, it, to be most plausible, that if there were a desire on the part of some of the police to silence Oswald, it would be because that, uh, not because Oswald was necessarily innocent, but because Oswald had been part of some kind of conspiracy and was about and could have revealed by comments he made, namely that he had an assignation with Tippett, for instance. That's the kind of thing that he might have revealed if... Uh, if, if not silenced, or that there was some other tie-in, which he was the patsy for someone. Now, my point was not, I would agree that Fritz could not have completely kept the FBI and the Secret Service out of those hearings, but uh, I would, he could, let me say it this way, if I had been Captain Fritz and I should have wished uh, to silence Oswald and in the meantime, before I could get him silenced, have a minimum number of people, have a minimum risk, I would have taken him away from that office which was besieged with people. I would have moved into a situation in which only the very limited number of, the very minimum number of Secret Service and FBI could appear. For instance, uh, I would have said on the ground that I cannot question a prisoner well when there's a crowd in my office. We will restrict the questioning to FBI and, and Secret Service. I would have then, I would have even tried to minimize the amount of time they were there if they weren't in on it with me. But Fritz here not only does not take Oswald to another room in that very large jail for questioning, enough to get him out of the crowd, but even leaves Oswald alone with, with just ordinary cops. What's this guy going to say to those cops if he has things that, that better not be said? Jack, I see your point, Charles. Jack, it's uh, quite easy to speculate on uh, a conspiracy between Oswald and any one of the people he came in contact with, uh, either shortly before the assassination or thereafter. But I think we ought to take into account that uh, insofar as the commission was concerned, we can assume that based on the evidence before them, the guilt of Oswald was quite clear. 
The only thing, of course, uh, that was unclear is whether or not he did it alone or whether or not anyone else was part of a conspiracy. Because one of the important things they were charged with, and obviously was of great concern to them, is whether or not any other individual, organization, or government was conceivably behind this assassination of our president. And so, uh, as I say, while, while, we can, while we can speculate in any direction we want, so whether it's Captain Fritz or Curry or Tippett, you name anyone, his wife even, you can implicate anyone, Oswald, you can implicate anyone you want along the way and say, in a sense, is he suspect or isn't he? But the fact of the matter is that the commission exhaustively uh, investigated this matter of was there any other conspirator, be he an individual or a political party or a government, and they, based on their extensive investigation, is based on what the FBI investigated, as well as every other agency of the government concluded that on the evidence before them, from every source they could find, including, for example, a counsel to Mrs. Oswald, who was invited to appear and had suggested to them that he had evidence of a conspiracy between this chap Weissman, who had that advertisement in the newspaper that day that Kennedy was supposed to, or President Kennedy was to arrive, and Ruby. There was some evidence of uh, Oswald, Ruby, and this fellow Weissman having met... No, him. not Oswald. Tippett. Tippett, excuse me. T excuse me, you're right. Tippett... Uh, Ruby and Weissman having met uh, previous to the assassination. He was twice invited, the, pres the attorney for uh, uh, the mother of Oswald, to give whatever evidence or proof he has on that subject, and each time he had some excuse. One time it was a privileged communication. He couldn't disclose it. And uh, in the final analysis, there was just no proof of any... Well, wait a minute. You're not, you're not telling the story quite accurately. Uh, he, I'm no fan of his, uh, I'd like to say, but uh, he, uh, you're not really being fair with him. He did appear twice before the commission. Incidentally, he was the only witness who appeared in public uh, to give his testimony. And uh, that was because he insisted on it. Well, he did. He exercised the legal rights. Yes. Okay. And uh, he did tell the story, as he had been provided with it, of a meeting at the Carousel Club, Jack Ruby's Club, between Tippett and, and Ruby and Weissman. Uh, the only thing he said he couldn't reveal was the source of this information. Now, uh, this may impress some people as uh, withholding information. It may impress others as a perfectly acceptable route to follow. Uh, well, do you but accept it as a rule in the circumstance and investigation? No, no, I don't. Time, do you I do not. Justify? Well, I do not. I would no more accept his holding out uh, than I would the commission's holding out. Let me let me respond to to one point that Mr. Kramer made, and that was when he said that the commission exhaustively investigated the possibility of conspiracy in this case. Here, I would categorically disagree, and I'll say why. I know that if I were confronted with a logical plausibility that, say, Ca Captain Fritz, to take an example, could have been part of a conspiracy to silence Oswald, and if I, and if this became plausible to me because I noted things that, that were somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat the way I shouldn't have wanted them, namely the lack of a transcript, and then, and then uh, the coincidental, the, the perhaps coincidental precision of Ruby's arrival, I would have cross-examined, as, as a minimum, I would have cross-examined Fritz very thoroughly. And I, and I underline, excuse me, and I underline cross-examine. I would have, I would have gone through the record as carefully as possible. I would have tried to have seen, as a staff counsel, are there any contradictions in Fritz's testimony about the situation? Because what I'm now trying to find out is whether this man is telling the truth. Well, Chris, That's you know there were well, contradictions, you know that. Uh, what, what, uh, was there any proof or any suggestion, uh, any question that occurs to you that the commission might have asked Fritz would have clarified a possible conspiracy between Ruby and Fritz? Hundreds of well, questions. Well, matter why this is well, before, right. I think that the important thing, Curtis was, was uh, detailing a modus operandi that he would have used had he been staff counsel, and I think that let's, uh, we should give him the opportunity to complete that. Let me say that one of the questions I had originally um, presented to the Warren Commission, so to speak, in this article I wrote right when the uh, report was published, was... Uh, 
How assiduously did the Commission cross-examine its witnesses, and how impartially did it do so? Uh, I didn't know. You can't tell from the report. You have to go to the testimony to see this. I discovered two things. One, that the Commission did cross-examine vigorously almost always only when the witness's story was different from the prevailing thesis which the Commission was working in terms of. And that uh, this, that Fritz is only one of many examples in which a, shall I say, friendly witness, and I mean just friendly to the, the intellectual predilections, so inclinations of the Commission, was not cross-examined. He was drawn out as to what his story was, but he was not cross-examined in the way you cross-examine a man when you are attempting to see whether he's an honest man. Now, um, I, there were several things here that, that are, uh, and this, I think, is one of the very great failures from the point of view of a procedure of investigation. The Commission not only, Mr. Fox is perfectly right, that the Commission failed to appoint an active devil's advocate, so to speak, a man who'd go in there and raise all the hard questions that a defense lawyer would have raised in a trial. Not only did the Commission's appointee to do that, and Walter Craig, I think was his name, fail to do that, but the Commission itself did not appoint any of its own staff informally to do this. So you can read through the testimony and not find this kind of cross-examination. On the contrary, not only did they not cross-examine, they led the witnesses. They led the witnesses. They, they had a... If you were a witness, and I was one of staff counsel, you and I talked over in advance of the deposition what we were going to talk about. So you knew the questions I was going to raise. So none of my questions came as a surprise to you. Mm. And therefore, uh, uh, I added obstacles in my way of determining your veracity. And that's what I'm talking about. We have not as yet been as exhaustive, or not that we've been exhaustive with such, but we have not been... I don't think we've even gone below the surface in the case of uh, uh, Jack Ruby being a conspiratorial uh, conspiratorial uh, party. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to you, Sylvan Fox, on that aspect. Well, I think I don't think you have uh, a whole lot of evidence uh, beforehand of uh, any conspiracy involving Jack Ruby. Uh, there's no there's no evidence at all that I can recall that suggests this up to the time of the uh, assassination. From then on, you have all kinds of, uh, of hints and suggestions, and the most crucial one is this precision of arrival in that police station. Because Ruby, interestingly enough, his testimony is very rambling and hard to, hard to make anything out of, and he talks about uh, strange things uh, which would seem to indicate an irrational man. But every now and then a, uh, a little flash of something comes through. And uh, when he was questioned about the uh, uh, precision of his arrival in the police station, he uh, kind of laughed it off and said, well, it would have, I would have had to have, if it happened the way you say, I would have had to have help from the police. So he himself, in this kind of backhanded way, uh, raises the possibility of his participation in a conspiracy involving the police. Let me say about, about Ruby, tying into the point I just made about lack of cross-examination, I was flabbergasted at the lack of cross-examination of Ruby. I, I went over his testimony very carefully when it was published in advance of the release of the other and then confirmed by the documents. He was rambling, I think, had lost uh, parts of his rationality. But just to give an instance of a case we have brought up, this, uh, uh, alleged, this meeting which Mark Lane alleges to have happened between uh, Weissman, Tippett, and Ruby, is that the trial? Right. Um, Chief Justice Warren and uh, Chief Counsel J. Lee Rankin were present at the interrogation of Ruby, and they asked about this somewhat mistakenly. They put in an oil man, and they dropped uh, one of the figures. No, no, they had all of them plus the oil man. Plus the oil man. They so, added an oil so man. So they, they asked the question somewhat incorrectly, mm -hmm. and then 
Ruby mm-hmm. said, now I wonder what oil man that could have been, and they got, they got off into a discussion about various oil men in Dallas, and then the Chief Justice said, uh, I wanted the record to show that you had answered the question, and I swear to goodness, Ruby never answered that yes. question. And this gets and even wilder uh, later on, because Ruby asked for a, uh, a, a, uh, a lie detector test, and at the lie detector test, these questions can only be put in a yes or no form. It's necessary for a lie detector test. So he was asked about this meeting again under the lie detector, but this time he was asked whether he had attended a meeting of, Ru- of Ruby Os- Ruby Tippett, no, Ruby uh, Weissman and Oswald. Again, the question was asked incorrectly. Well, no, I, I wanted to just point out that uh, this uh, whole episode with the meeting, although you may not uh, put much weight in it, and I, I did not, I must say, still the handling of it by the Warren Commission is really astonishing because this thing is obfuscated and confused down the line. And nowhere, they never get an answer about this meeting from Jack Ruby. And yet, at one point in that testimony, Warren says, well, thank you, Jack. I'm glad you answered the question. <laughs> well, and as you say, you uh, also stress the importance of having it included in the record. Or was it you? Yes, yes. 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 It seems to be the opinion. I, if I can speak for rank and file people, and I think I can because they're my people and I mingle with them, uh, it seems to be popular opinion that the, from what little penetration the public can make into the Warren report, because it is such a ponderous morass, uh, there is the impression that the line of questioning, the line of investigation is always conducted in such a manner as to disprove, uh, not, not to disprove uh, the, uh, the uh, conspiracy theory, but to rather prove the alternatives to the cons- uh, conspiracy theory. Charles? Uh, well, no, I, I don't think, uh, I can't agree with you there, Jack. I'm, uh, I'm only saying now, this is popular opinion. This is well, a file opinion. It may be, but uh, actually the commission uh, was trying, I think, its level best to see whether or not there were any other people involved besides Oswald. Uh, in, in deciding the guilt of Oswald, I don't think they had really much of a task. I, I think my own opinion, based on the proof, uh, which we may go into in a little while, uh, uh, the rifle and uh, the alias he used and uh, uh, all the other testimony, uh, uh, the fingerprint evidence, uh, the witnesses that saw him at the scene, the fact that he left the building. They, there were 15 employees working. These are not the questions that hang heavily in the no, minds of the public. But, but the point is that... The guilt of Oswald, I say, represented to the commission uh, no great difficulty. Uh, What was a problem was to see whether or not this lone soul, this youngster of 24, was responsible for the uh, catastrophic uh, uh, effect it had on the nation. And uh, so uh, the natural inclination would be, of course, to say, well, others must have been involved. That uh, one puny little uh, soul like him uh, could not have uh, uh, caused uh, these dire consequences. And so I think the Endeavor and I know all the uh, uh, investigative agencies were interested in knowing that for one other very good reason. Uh, if this was just, say, an individual who uh, was just a crackpot, say, and you charge it off as a madman, as history has shown other assassinations to have occurred, But here's a man who we knew had been engaged in political activity, who at the time was actively tied in with this Cuban progressive labor movement, which was pro-Castro. So we we better correct that. I mean, there's another error. Uh, You you lifted that out of my book incorrectly. He was tied up with a group called the the, uh, Fair Play for for Cuba Cuba Committee. That group had nothing to do with the progressive labor movement. Well, all right. Well, we'll st- uh, 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 the name of the progressive labor movement uh, as one of the groups uh, tied in in the political activity uh, of uh, uh, Oswald is there. But in any event, here you had a, had a situation of a man who at the very time of the assassination was actively engaged uh, in a political movement uh, that was uh, 
uh, an enemy uh, of uh, this country. And so the search was an extensive one to see whether or not, if one, uh, was there some political organization in this country that was in back of this assassination, and beyond that was some, uh, some foreign country involved in it. Now that's where a good deal of the effort and energy went, Jack. And based on an exhaustive determination of that by all our investigative agencies, and I don't just mean the FBI, I mean every department available to us, including the Attorney General, who by coincidence uh, happened to be the brother of the late president. So no stone was left unturned. Uh, I must go along. Uh, there are discrepancies. Uh, uh, the investigation in certain areas by the commission might have been more thorough, as has been suggested uh, by both the, the other gentlemen. But in the final analysis, the search was to see if there was any other conspirator. And in their answers, they say that based on all the evidence we have found available to us and submitted by every investigative agency and what we ourselves could find, we find no sense. On the one hand, on the one hand, you say this was a, a thorough, exhaustive investigation. No stern, stone was left unturned. And on the other, you say, well, they may have they may have overlooked a few things here and there. You've got to take your stand. My contention, indeed, is that they have overlooked a few things here and there. And this is a very serious statement to make.